Yeah. Is that the right position? Uh, first of all, I'd like to say thank you for Dave for inviting me along today uh, and the Finding Petroleum setup. Uh, I'm here on behalf of Arkex and it's an honour to talk in this building again. Uh, last time I talked here was in 19, uh, got to be 86, and it was something like recent advances in geology or modelling. And there was a Peter Verrill, who was a structural guru at Chevron, and a couple of uh, partners in crime, a Peter Vale doing something on seismic stratigraphy, and I was there doing backstripping and thermal modelling, and I presume you call it petroleum systems analysis these days. So, uh, with that, I'll move on. Uh, use of integration, gravity gradiometry and the workflow. I looked at the, uh, the attendance list, it looks like we've got people in here who are analysts and possibly fund managers, so there's geologists, there's engineers, real multidisciplinary setup. So my talk is going to try and target everybody. So I'm not going to delve deep into uh, mathematics and uh, finances. How does it fit into the integrated exploration workflow? I will be showing some examples. I'm going to go large scale regional and then a little bit like Peter did earlier, show you how you can actually get down towards the prospect and lead level uh, with the technique. Uh, this is probably all the maths you're going to see. And uh, gravity gradiometry is the measurement and the variations in the acceleration due to gravity. Effectively, the rate of change of rock properties. Um, so we just, up front, I'm just going to say gravity measures one component, this vertical component. The gradiometer is, if you like, it's capable of measuring in multiple directions, multi-tensor. You can see sideways, downwards, left, right, and it takes a lot of measurements. So, what your layer terms, GXX, and I'm not going to go through these in the maps that I'll show later, GXY, GXZ. It's basically, if you run a gradiometer over this cube, have a density variation of 2.7, 2.5, you'll get different images. And some of the tensors are good for picking the edges, other tensors are good for picking the corners. So if geology was all square boxes, it would be easy. Oops. Um, what's the gradiometer? Originally it was a Cold War technology uh, designed for the US Navy in the 70s. Uh, small in submarines for navigation and missile guidance. Uh, declassified in the mid 90s and it's still a rare technology. Eight, nine machines I think in the globe. Arkex operate three of them. Uh, normally we've got two on planes and one on a boat. Um, the one on the boat at the moment working with a big company out of Saudi Arabia in the Red Sea. And the other two, I think one's in Ethiopia at the moment. So, some of you have seen uh, Mark Davis talk, probably seen this before, but just remind that the gravity <coughs> measurement, if the plane would stay still, that's what, having a gravimeter and you get the perfect signal. However, we know with... Uh, <coughs> Planes, you get a lot of turbulence. They say, oh, don't worry, we can filter the noise. The trouble is, when you airborne gravity start filtering the noise, you filter some of the signal as well. Well, the gradiometer, it's got two of these, <coughs> uh, let's say springs, and it cancels out the motion. So what happens to one spring happens to the other. So we can get a really nice signal. Peter mentioned it, and Dirk mentioned it, integration. Uh, I've been doing it now for 25 years, groundwater, oil and gas, production, exploration. Get this right. This is what Arkex into here. We call it Blue Cube Bay, it's potential field. It's the magnetic data, it's the gravity, it's the gravity gradiometry, LIDAR. And client data over here, there's probably a lot more in here. I could have uh, the remote sensing, <laughs> geochemistry, but I've got cross-sections, topography. That box should be maybe 20 things and have this uh, uh, risking procedures uh, that Peter was mentioning. We'd all come by having more of that data. What do we do with this? First pass, a qualitative interpretation. And you'll see that uh, with gravity, 
um, gradiometry, structural maps, kinematic models. And then we can go more quantitative. As we get well data, seismic data, we can start to test some of the uh, observed versus calculated responses. Um, this is onshore Gabon. Now, this isn't one of the examples, but just to demystify everything about interpretation, certainly for the guys who have not done much geology, it would be very difficult uh, taking running seismic crews across there, even taking samples. Get an instrument in a plane, fly over it 200 metres, you get some reasonable results. So ground gravity. Now this is if you walk and you put the gravimeter, you take a measurement at each one of these stations. And it's really an easy interpreting, whether it's seismic or whatever. We look for eyes. Whoops. Will it catch up? What am I pointing at? Yeah. So red is high. Blue is low, dead easy. Airborne gravity. Well, I said, well, we get the problems. We get sort of noise in there. We might filter it out. But anyway, you still do the same. You say, well, I've got some highs. I've got some lows. And they get gravity gradiometry. You've got lots of highs, lots of lows, but you need to know what they are. So what I'll do, I'll take one of those components, the GZ, and say, GZ is what gravity measures. So I'll look at the GZ calculated from the GZZ, and I overlay the gravity what we from the air, and we still see the highs and the lows. And you look at the lows that we marked on that uh, uh, gravity reading. Yeah, okay, we've got the highs and the lows, but we've also got a lot of lows and a lot of highs. And if we've got a couple of seismic lines across here, wells, we start to understand what these lows are. And you'll see now that these are salt walls. Now, why is this important? This isn't a silver bullet technique, but just, we maybe got lucky, but you'll see that any well that's producing and a discovery lies where the blue is. You need that salt. It's a, it's a pre-salt trap. You're looking for seal. If you remember the terrain, you've not got lots and lots of seismic, so drilling in that terrain, it was not surprising that there was a dry well, dry well, dry well, dry well. This wasn't drilled, this was after these wells were drilled, the shock radiometry to get uh, an improved understanding. Okay, so again, just keep it nice and simple. The first map we looked at Large wavelength, probably looking at the structure of the basin, where the gravens are, where the fault blocks. Go higher up. We're also interested, gradiometry gives us information of nearer to the surface, so we can see where the salt walls are. So, I'm not going to show the GZ or the much, I'm going to show you some highs and lows interpreted from a data set and then show you the end result. So, again, have a look at this the GZ, got a high and a low. GZZ, we can see oh, a few highs and a few more lows. But what you do by looking at these tensors, if you're doing it manually, is you're building up your pattern recognition, really. But it's starting to look geological. And look, but this is the GXZ. Remember, one of them was giving you the corners of the block, another one was giving you the edges. Hey, it looks a bit geological. We need it there. So we end up with that. And there's an image now of highs and lows. And it's auto edging. So things like your auto track in seismic, you can bump this into um, the software that we use at Arc X in Arcfield, press a button, have cutoffs, and it'll give you a load of lineaments. You don't have to keep dodging it in. And, although it does help to understand where we're coming from when you do do it manually. But there's a, there's a geological story from all these tensors. And in this area, we had a few geological problems. First of all, it looks like there's grabbins and there's transform faults and there's movement, differential. We've moved one way one, 50 million years later, there's a different rotation. Some of the fill looks as if it's got an eye mag, uh, mag signature. Other looks as if it's got a low magnetic. So it's not just gravity gradiometry, it's magnetic signature we're looking at as well. So in this complicated area, oh, we've also got lava flows. And then some of the grabbins look as if they popped up, they transpressed. 
So you've got inverted trans press, look like they've got a uh, uh, mag signature. Now could you tell that from just looking at that? No, you tell, you build that story up from looking at the individual tensor and looking at the data, bringing it together, integrating. Here's a face on Mars. Now it's all about what I've showed is resolution, bandwidth. So here's the face. Being a, let's go back again. There we go. We say it's like conventional gravity. That's what you see. You, d you definitely see the shape. Bit more resolution. Now I'm a one-eyed, well, I was a one-eyed 3D interpretation geophysicist and I've never been able to see faces on this, but we did a bit of processing and I've never seen a face on it. <laughs> <laughs> and you can reprocess it with another vector. And they said, there's definitely a face on there, Dave. And I said, you are kidding. I have never, <laughs> I've never seen a face on it. So anyway, let's get to the real examples now. Um, <laughs> offshore Gabon. Come on. Here are the play types. I'm not going to go through. Uh, but essentially four plays, eh? pre-salt plays. Uh, the gamba and the dental underneath the salt. So it's really important to know where the salt is for those plays. We've got the carbonate, which is a post-salt. Then we've got slope fans, possibly as even possibly shallow. I don't think they're shallow in the Cretaceous. And then we've got basin floor fans, slope fans in the tertiary. So again, we filter. Here's a gradiometry image, and here's a regional seismic line. And again, we've got highs and lows. It, it, does, it looks geological at this stage. And what we're actually looking at is these high amplitudes here seem to correlate with the red highs and the salt in below seems to correlate with the lows. I'm not going to go into great detail on this. You do have to filter. You can have a look at raw data. There's various filters. You've got observed data, calculated data. <coughs> the geological model is there. It's essentially after depth conversion Got to be happy with the depth conversion, processing, and we interpret plastics, carbonates, and salt. So, again, looking at different vectors, here's a GZ image, and that's the measurement. <laughs> what am I pointing at down here or up there? <laughs> Here's the GZZ now, we're measuring in all directions. And if I go back, hopefully it'll go back. Oops. See the change. Now I'm going to focus in on this area to uh, quick interpretation. So there's the area, there's the display. We can display it like that or we can display it like that. Basically, personal preference. Let's have a look. A couple of seismic lines, five kilometres apart. Sparse seismic, regional seismic. There is seismic on there. It's just a little bit light at the moment. It's somewhere we did with the CGGB. And I will zoom in on these areas to show you that I'm not uh, forcing the data. But on the top line, there's certainly salt identified. And on these, basically, there's still remnant salt. There's the collapse rafts of the carbonate. On here, it looks like sediment on carbonate, the carbonate on carbonate wells, little or no salt. We look at the uh, GZZ between them. Yeah, this low value here, low value. Yeah, I think I'd be pretty happy to link that along that low. This one, I'd be pretty happy to maybe say it's thinning out in that direction. Little or no salt at the far end. And this one doesn't look as if it goes very far at all. It looks as if it's just isolated. So that's what we'd be interpreting from two, two seismic lines in a gradiometry image. So here's the plays I mentioned, the pre-salt. Plastics, gamba, dental, carbonate, plastics, plastics. There's the salt. There's what we'd be looking for. We'd want to know where the salt is, possibly a trap here. These might rely on salt seal. They might rely on interformational seal for the dental. The other thing is, is whether it's extensional, compressional, transpressional, as you put these sections together, it's like jigsaws. So I always like to sort of see how the thing 
forms. So there we go, big salt basin, and then we get carbonate deposited. Oops, <laughs> moving too quick. And the salt starts to move out, the weight of this carbonate, and the salt's disturbed, sediment loading. You even get some fault in. Essentially, just interrogating the, uh, the, the, the uh, section. So it's not just interpret gradiometry seismic. There's a whole range. Structural restoration is another important thing. Are those bright amplitudes that we see on the seismic, are they carbonate rafts? Or are they cap rock? And drill them. So here we are. Let's put it in. Transform seismic lines, faults. There's the fault. Here's the rope, the sediment. Sediment on the knee, sediment here, on the top of the salt image down here, and the base is actually on the knee. Isolated. Faults. There we go. Sediment, sediment. It's not a low this side. There's a low maybe further back over here, just off the section. But this is interpreted as no salt in this structure. So by building up that, we heard earlier about de-risking and um, whatever. Maybe you've got to incorporate this, that uh, high risk on salt seal. Where those rafts are flat, thin salt, there's a higher risk on salt being a seal. Low risk here, maybe medium risk in that area. So let's bring in your gradiometry as one of the big toolbox into the risking process. Now this one I would have loved to show the data, but if you log on to HRT Petroleum, I think it's on the website, absolutely fantastic gradiometry and magnetic data over the Solimoes Basin. We worked it, and the reason I put it up is, again, the environment. And HRT and Petrobras, sparse seismic, gravity, gradiometry, magnetics, have had quite a lot of, well, Petrobras have had the success, HRT had just started their campaign. Another well, study we did, Algeria, this area was 180 kilometres by 80 kilometres. You see these faults, here's a Google image. Overlay the map. This map was produced by French geologists, late 30s, pre Second World War, post Second World War. They probably used aerial photographs because there's a one for one, you see, wherever they put those faults, they got them in a reasonable position. Okay. There were two wells drilled in the area, no seismic. Two wells drilled on surface mapping. The core of this anticline, the darker blue, is lower, lower Cretaceous, and the lighter blue is upper Cretaceous. And there's also a lot of quaternary, or even sort of piggyback little basins, uh, confusing the surface geology. Sonatrack have gone into this area, they've shot seismic. They shot some seismic, 20... 25 years after they drilled the wells, just to see if they drilled the wells in the right place, or to understand them. And um, I will show you the, the line through the well, and then I will show you some this seismic lines here. This was shot in 2009-2010 as a coarse grid to link in with a great full gradiometry survey. So, yeah, the well, there's the surface geology, as I say. They put it on the top of the anticline and on a, a line through the well it looks perfect. There were oil shows at the Aptian level on this well. So this line was shot in 1978 I think. Now these other lines have been shot in 2009-2010. At this for the gradiometry it looks as if it's down structure a little bit. So if we actually go in and interpret what the lines look like, there's three seismic lines, dip lines, and there's offsets on these structures here. Actually, these seem to correlate, well they do correlate with the surface faults that were mapped. And also, although this ramp doesn't quite get there on this line, it's halfway across. That's the dip line, here's the strike line. Um, lateral ramps and Italian atlas. The well would basically be in this position, and there's a dome in here, and a ramp feature through here. So the top of the structure is just here. So we've now gone down prospect level. I'm going to rush a little bit. Oops, let me go back. <laughs> so we've got surface mapping, got gradiometry images, and as you'll see later, there's a lot of structural restoration. Thrust belts, you've got to balance those sections. I'm not showing it on this lot. Uh, that's up to the sonar track guys. 
Middle East, sand dunes, uh, Dubai, or part of Dubai, uh, northeast, southwest trend, you can see some of the what look like channels coming through here, a drainage, near surface, nice rolling dunes. Got the survey. There's the GZ. There's the GZZ. Lovely image. Uh, you wouldn't have much or any problem picking out the thrust from. And again, just remind you, there's the gravity, the GZ, or what we measure at gravity, and then the multi tensor data. Magnetic data. Come up with a qualitative interpretation. This is a mature area, Amoco, uh, Arco, uh, gas fields, oil fields in the area, 20, 30 years of production. This was shot basically to see if they could find any add on features. Uh, quantitative modelling there, you've got to go <coughs> interpretation. Now I won't show the seismic, some of the seismic are absolutely appalling. It's sort of just see the top of the thrust. You don't know what's going on underneath. There's other parts of the data. You can see reasonable interpretation to the serve. But the client gave us this model to begin with. I say, kick it off. And you see we're, we're lacking here. These red and blue lines. We need some higher density over on the left, lower density on the right. It doesn't take much for the structural geologists to come in and say, you sure you've not got a ramp in here and you've got a little bit of a piggyback, a lower density in here? And the seismic pool, you don't know, but at least we've got a model. It's not saying it's right, but it seems to fit this data. So, as I say, in a mature area now, if you've got gradient and you've got well data, you can bring other data into it. So, a PSDM seismic, this was uh, reprocessed about three years ago. Remember all the faults coming from, all the thrusts coming from the right? Well, it looks like there's back thrust in an imbrication <coughs> through here. So, yeah, the, all the thrusts are coming from Oman over here at the deep level, the Thermoma, the target zone. Whereas up the top here, looks as if there's areas where back thrusting has accommodated. And you've also got another upper major detachment surface. So, how do you fit it? Well, you can take your seismic dips, you can take the well dips as well in some of the lines. It's 30 degrees, dipping to the right in the upper part of the well, and all the dips in the lower part, 11 and 15, dipping in the opposite direction. So this model's fitting in reasonably nicely now. Erosion. Buried stuff, lifted up, it's got a high density near to the surface. So if areas have been popped up, low density still here, no erosion. Off here, this will be high density, maybe less erosion here, lower density. You're bringing it together, this structural restoration. Um, balancing the section, interpretation, just go back and see, you know, does it all fit together? Have I got any holes in my jigsaw? Sometimes you have holes because there's out to plane movement. But, use as many techniques. Bringing it all together, here's the gradiometry image. Here's uh, basically one boomer in the seismic, and then you can construct dip isogons off it and forecast where the thrust would be. Back thrust here. Little ramp here seems to be imaged quite nicely. Analogs. This is surface now on short appellations. Folds seem to come to a tip or an interference zone, and then here. This is a flat, a ramp, and a flat. You push things against sloping surfaces, and the folds interfere. Use this analog. Go back to the original interpretation, looking at this data: fold, fold interference. Start to forecast where your ramps are at depth. These. I put these in. Today, or yesterday, because it's very recent work, if you go and look at foreign energy, basically they're chasing a reef play up in Nova Scotia, and they've got one seismic line, they shot a gradiometry survey over this area, and we believe the gradiometry survey is highlighting structure on the reefs. Not all of them are going to be reefs, some of them might be slight pop-ups, it is a compressive regime, Here's the analog, but it's planning the data. This year, they're now going to shoot the 2011 2D program, seismic. So going back prior to this, there was oops, <laughs> one seismic line off the structure. This is now, you can see where they're focusing. 
So it's uh, they're quite happy. They uh, it 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 is allowing them to focus the, the budget and the uh, position of the seismic. I'm not going to say too much about this because I believe Joe's going to be saying a lot about East Africa. We've done a lot of work in East Africa. This is a gradiometry image. <coughs> you can see the lows, the soft, the controlling fault. With this image and these yellow lines, the seismic, the client with the gradiometry data, two dry wells, reanalysis re in the light of the gradiometry data, change these uh, sediment supply model, maturity models, the petroleum system model. So what are the success factors? High resolution 3D nature of the gravity gradiometry. It's a vehicle, it's not a silver bullet. In some areas, hopefully Joel will say, look, in this area it's a silver bullet maybe. But it's a vehicle that you can pull things together and stick all the glue on, whether it's geochemistry, structural geology or whatever. Integrate as much data, as many sources as possible. I think Peter brought that out earlier. Strong multidisciplinary team, good workflows and rapid communication. Um, it's a thank you. I've missed uh, terror resources off here and foreign energy, but uh, as I say, uh, thank you to these people. And at that point, I'd like to leave you with one serious thought: is wherever you do business, uh, try and just leave your footprint. Don't put your footprint on whichever country. If you don't do it in this country, then don't do it. And there's a really good example over last weekend of somebody making sure that you don't leave your footprint. And uh, <laughs> with that, I'll say thank you very much. <laughs>